Our second speaker today is Rachel Enfield from Mark Forge, um, who I'm very excited to hear from. And that one of my Mark Forge printers has um, decided to kick the bucket today. So I may have to talk to her later, um, but I will just bring Rachel on stage. Sorry, take a second. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, Rachel's going to be talking about the future of 3D food printing and opportunities for space applications, which is a really exciting topic. Um, and I will give the floor over to you, Rachel, if you're happy to share your screen. Yes, I will get that up right now. I need to make sure I'm in presenter view. I've got my own notes, so that's it. Important to make sure I'm sharing the right thing. There we go. Okay. Okay, is my I good on my screen? Perfect. Can see it well. Thanks, Rachel. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Rachel Enfield. Um, I studied food science and computer science at UMass Amherst in, in Massachusetts. Uh, I work as the Senior Materials Laboratory Technician at Mark Forge now, where I manage the lab, I run experiments, and I print parts. My passions include 3D printing, food, and 3D printing food. So uh, if you're interested in learning anything more about uh, anything that I'm going to talk about, uh, send me an email, reach out, and I'll be happy to put you into, uh, give you a copy of my paper. So um, we were at a 3D printing conference, so hopefully we'll, we're all a little bit familiar with 3D printing. But basically, there are seven technologies of 3D printing, that photopolymerization, uh, powder bed uh, fusion, material jetting, binder jetting, material extrusion, direct energy deposition, and uh, sheet lamination. And only four of those seven are actually applicable to be able to print food right now, or at least have been explored. There's potential for anything, like any type of, uh, any type of technology to be you know, food related, but Right now, it's uh, mostly those four. So here's an image of the way that each of these works. So uh, we've got material jetting, that's A right up there, uh, binder jetting, powder bed fusion, and material extrusion. So let's talk about why we're all here. Why should you print food? Well, there are many reasons, but just like imagine, you wouldn't download a pizza, but what if you could? There are tech, there's technology that's uh, being developed to literally print pizzas. So 3D printing food can solve many problems, and those and, and like its solutions come in the form of customizability. If you can customize the nutrition, flavor, mouthfeel, and uh, accessibility. For yourself then there are plenty of there's like endless opportunities for what you can print so one in four uh adults over the age of 50 don't have the ability to chew uh, or have the ability to chew but don't have like a um a good ability to chew so that means that it limits the foods they can eat so if you can change the texture of the food to be able to actually enjoy it again that can that opens up a huge range of possibilities for uh for food um Accessibility. So families that don't have time to cook on their own, people with disabilities, again, elderly with jaw, uh, elderly with jaw issues, picky eaters. Uh, you know, if you, if you have food insecurity, which is a huge problem in the US and across the world, uh, you could potentially create food inks, like, uh, like a soy based solution or something. And a, uh, and just package that in a plate in like a place and be able to uh, be able to ship it all around the world. There's also like allergens. So if, you, if you're allergic to something, you don't have to be, you can eat food, you can taste food that actually has these, like would technically normally have this, but be able to actually enjoy it in a way that's not life-threatening. Um, it's also sustainability. So 3D printing food has the uh, has potential to revolutionize the way that we uh, tra like transport food, uh, we deal with livestock, we reduce emissions, and it has uh, the potential to reduce food waste. So imagine again, like I said, if you're just going, if you're going to grow, grow some kind of vegetable or something that you process and in a location, you don't have to worry about different types of 
uh, packaging because the look of the food is less important than the actual safety and nutrition of it. So if you are actually, uh, if you don't have to worry about it getting damaged, you can be more efficient in how you actually ship things. And then there's food safety. So there are certain factors, intrinsic and ent extrinsic factors of uh, food safety. I don't know if anyone here is a food scientist. I'd love to hear if you are, but uh, you might be familiar with this. Like intrinsic factors are, say, the P uh, pH balance of the food, the moisture content, and the water activity. Those are two different things, in case you're wondering. Um, and then extrinsic factors are like the environment that it's in, like the atmosphere or the temperature of the actual thing, uh, of the actual location. So that's important for if you're like, if you can package this in a way that like it reduces oxygen uh, access, I guess. Um, so like it's not going to oxidize the food as much. It, there's less of a chance of it getting uh, infected with something, you know, all sorts of different things. But, you know, you're all here for a reason. Let's talk about the space aspect. So all of these reasons are a big, a big part of like, of the reason why it'd be very useful for space. Uh, people who, there's a, there was a study done that if you don't have access, if um, that if you eat the same thing for 21 consecutive days, you actually stop getting some of the nutritional benefits because if you're not enjoying the things that you're eating, you actually don't absorb it as well. Uh, so in space, you don't have access to food. So you don't have the ability to customize uh, or like to, to have whatever you want. Everything is prepackaged already. Uh, Again, accessibility is, an, uh, is a big thing where if you have specific dietary needs, you can actually adjust your food to whatever levels you need it to be. Sustainability. There's only so much stuff that can go up into space. Uh, everything needs to be counted for when you're actually like on the space mission. Excuse me, like, everything is, uh, it has to be weighed, everything has to be packaged in a specific way, and everything has to be safe. So if you don't have to worry about as much about like food safety, which we'll talk about later on what the current technologies are that are being used in space, um, then you have the possibilities are much more open. So let's talk about what is 3D food printing. So as many of you are familiar with 3D printing in general, uh, four of the technologies uh, are applicable to food printing. So material jetting, binder jetting, powder bed fusion, and material extrusion. For material jetting, uh, you can print things like uh, cake icing or other low viscosity toppings. It's generally a much, the, it's limited in how many and like what you can actually print because it's mostly limited to 2D designs because things that are low viscosity don't build up well. So you can't really create, build up on itself to create a 3D structure. So instead, a company called Foodjet uh, creates toppings on cakes, put like icings on cake, uh, puts pizza sauce on pizza. It's good for like deposition uh, of that kind of material. As you can see in that picture, there are, uh, you can put chocolate in like, uh, in like waffles or on top of cookies to create uh, fast and full color designs. But again, limited mostly to 2D. And we've got binder jetting, which there's a company doing this called Sugar Labs, which I will talk about on the next slide too. But so materials that you're using are like li uh, li a liquid binder and then powder materials like sugar, starch, and corn flour. Uh, advantages of this are that it's fast, there's complex geometry, and it's full color, but it's also got limited materials. So you have to use a powdered material like sugar, starch, or chocolate. Um, uh, the Sugar Labs is doing, a, uh, doing some really cool things. I highly suggest you check this out. Uh, using binder jetting with sugar, water, and vegetable starch, and food colorings to make those uh, very exciting and cool looking uh, shapes. They do like bonbons, they do, uh, um, they do like just candies. I'm pretty sure that the, someone, uh, the founder is doing a talk tomorrow, so I'm gonna check that out. Um, then we've got powder bed fusion. So this uses again, powdered materials like sugar or chocolate. Uh, you can do complex geometry, but it's also slow. And again, there's limited materials. Fun fact, uh, the, only per the only group that has done this is a company called Candy Fab, which was a, uh, which was a company from 2006 to 2009 that did powder bed fusion. So if you've read anything about uh, 3D food printing and they talked about powder bed fusion, they're probably talking about this one uh, instance of uh, people working with powder bed fusion. Again, this because of the limit of materials, it's not the most viable for like full meals. 
Then that brings us to material extrusion. So this is uh, the most common type of uh, 3D printing in terms of for printing and also for hobbyists. So um, that you know makes sense to me. It's got a huge range of materials. It's accessible. It's affordable. The problems being that it's slow. So I'm sure if any of you have 3D printed something, you know it takes a lot of time. Uh, sometimes you'd like it to take a little bit less time, especially because if you want to print a meal, that's not time that you have, especially with like food safety factors, which I'm not sure if everyone knows, but you're not supposed to have certain foods out for longer than two hours with, uh, without being properly refrigerated or properly heated. So you have to keep things hot, you have to keep things cold. It's very important. There are actually a bunch of things in the market, like there's pancake bots um, where they can print out uh, pancakes in different shapes and designs, which I think is really cool. It's almost more like a material jetting uh, example because it's 2D, but you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You can actually find these in a lot of, um, in a lot of hotels. I don't know if any of you have seen those. I've seen some. Uh, there's things like uh, My Cuisini has stuff, uh, like they do chocolate. You've got the Foodini, which prints with uh, food or like fruit and vegetable purees, uh, which is all really cool stuff. And we're actually going to talk about these kinds of materials uh, now. So what and how? What kind of materials are we using? Edible links can be made of uh, three building blocks. So all foods are made of five materials, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, otherwise known as fats, ash, and water. Ash is like minerals um, and like salts. And uh, carbohydrates are like uh, grains and starches, proteins of meat and dairy, uh, sometimes dairy, fats are like oils, other kinds of dairy like butter. And, cho uh, and chocolate is the most common type of lipid that is used for 3D printing. So why, why is this different than printing with uh, plastic? Well, it's different because there are different ways that you can, uh, that you can create structures. And the structure is uh is very dependent on the type of uh the texture is very dependent on the structure that you use so some carbohydrates and proteins go through sol gel transitions which is like a cold setting gel formation which is like gelatin agar carrageenan and then there's heat setting gels like whey and egg protein and cross-linking that can happen with alginate and calcium ions excuse me um which is another way of forming structures uh, for lipids, this is uh, different because they are fluid at high temperatures and solid at low temperatures, and they solidify through crystallization. So chocolate is the most common type of, um, of lipid that is, that is 3D printed, and it's pretty complicated if you're printing with pure chocolate. Uh, so because there are six polymorphs of chocolate, uh, which you have to consider. So these are different like crystallization structures that you can achieve based off of how you heat, cool, and heat. Uh, heats chocolate again. So if you've ever tempered chocolate, this is what you're actually dealing with. You're dealing with the polymorphs. So if you've ever seen a chocolatier put chocolate on like the lip, like right above their lip, that is because they are testing the temperature at which you are, um, you are processing this chocolate to make sure that it's at just the right temperature so that when you cool it and then heat it again, it uh, achieves the right glossy texture and, or glossy sheen and the right uh, like crisp texture when you actually crack it. So part of the reason I'm talking about this is because different printing factors are, uh, there are different printing factors with how you actually achieve 3D printed food. So you need to be able to extrude at low yield stress, which is called extrudability, and hold your, hold your shape at high yield stress, like, which is the buildability. So you want to be able to, when you're pushing down on the nozzle, because most of these are going to be done with uh, some kind of like uh, nozzle which has a syringe in it. You want to be able to push it down and push it out while it's like a liquid-y thing, but then it needs to be solid once it's actually out to hold shape. So some foods have inherent re rheological characteristics that lend themselves well to being printed, uh, typically pseudoplastic foods which are uh, solid below a yield stress but fluid above it. Um, so that's like mashed potatoes, starch paste, and food, uh, food spreads. So there's a lot of different things that you got to consider. And that brings us to the rest of the paper, which is 3D printing food in space. So there's a lot of there are uh, there's a lot of research being done into 3D printing food or 3D printing in general for space. Uh, a lot of people have dealt with uh, different types of 3D printers. A lot of a lot of it being FDM, which is the most common type for material extrusion. Sorry, FDM is a type of material extrusion. Uh, in, in case you were wondering, um, but so. You need to be able to 
food in space should be small, uh, lightweight, easy to store, and convenient to eat. So you need to be able to think about what exactly is going into the 3D printer and what is coming out. So imagine if you could make yourself a meal, if you could just go into mesh mixer like I did and just kind of like cat up your own like uh, breakfast spread, which, you know, <laughs> it's a possibility in the future if you can just kind of choose what you want to do. Um, it has to be able to uh, it has to be able to kind of hold shape after it's been done and has to, and hopefully in the future you'll be able to have all these different structures on the same build plate without having to sacrifice any kind of um, resolution. So as I mentioned, we can talk about some of the different technologies that are a bit currently available for uh, food in space. So currently available technologies that have like older ones are like freeze drying, retort th thermostabilization and irradiation, which are great, but they don't have very long shelf lives. So you can't keep them for, for a long time. There's emergent technologies like uh, pressure assisted thermostabilization, microwave assisted thermostabilization. Uh, but these are all these all have to happen on Earth. You cannot process these when you're in space unless you're doing something special, I guess. But uh, 3D printing allows for the ability to potentially make food in space without having to without having to prepare everything uh, ahead of time. You can you can just have the raw material prepared and the uh, different types of additives that you're putting into it already set aside and ready to go. So current technologies just aren't there yet for like I say a longer term space mission like a mission to Mars uh, which would have to you know be for like five years and right now we don't know the limits of shelf life of food of food printing but we do know the shelf the limitations of the things that we already have so there are special challenges when it comes to printing in space uh, texture is uh, or printing in, for food in general, but also specifically space. Texture is mouthfeel. Uh, printing in zero gravity is very different than printing on Earth, which there hasn't been, there's been a, like studies done, but um, like there's a reason why FDM is the most popular because you don't have loose particles, like something like powder bed fusion, uh, material jetting or, fi or finer jetting would have. So it's really important to consider these different factors when you're doing it. So like uh, these different, uh, particle-based printing would be very helpful on the surface of a planet, like say Mars or the moon, where you could use that to say build houses or different things with the raw materials that you already have there. But in zero gravity, loose particles are very dangerous because you can uh, they can just get everywhere. They could potentially like, um, you can't collect them very easily. There's lots of different uh, reasons why you wouldn't want that. Food safety is an issue. So like as food safety is always gonna be an issue. I studied food safety, so I'm gonna talk about it <laughs> like forever, but um, if you ever, if you've ever dealt with, um, if you've ever had like your food go bad, if you've ever had food poisoning, you know food safety is a huge issue. You can't afford to have that in the space station. And um, then time. So as I mentioned before, material extrusion is not the fastest. It is, uh, it tends to be very slow. And if you need a meal out of it, you need to be able to print that in a reasonable amount of time. So there are specific challenges that are inherent to, um, to printing food in general and then printing with FDM. So there's, a, there's still t uh, a lot of time to, or there's a lot of room to grow in the industry. So here's what I'm hoping that you guys have taken away from this, that material extrusion is the most developed technology and applicable technology for printing food in space. Uh, food printing can solve major problems with cust uh, customization, accessibility, uh, sustainability, and food safety. And that food printing in space has its own special challenges. I hope you learned something about uh, about all these different, uh, different technologies that I've talked about. And if you're really interested in learning more, I wrote a paper. I can send you guys all a link to the actual paper. And then if you're interested in actually reading it, send me an email. Um, I feel like I may have talked a little bit fast. <laughs> I was very excited and nervous for this whole talk. So I would love to get some uh, some questions if anyone has any. Um, thank you, Rachel. That was a really awesome talk and it was getting a really excited response from the audience. I'm, you probably weren't looking obviously at the chat and everything as well, but um, yeah, I think everyone's just, it's it just, it's been the best 
I guess, agglomeration of all food science and material science and 3D printing stuff in one presentation that I've definitely seen in the 3D printing of food space. So absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, the, the top question uh, currently on the list is, can you please give examples of cross-linking related to carbohydrates and proteins? Uh, yeah, so uh, an example of that being uh, something like, uh, I think I'm, I mentioned it a little bit in the slide, uh, things like alginate in calcium uh, with calcium ions. So, so when I was in food science, we did some really fun experiments. I don't know, anyone who has like a kid or anything, you guys should, uh, or like wants to go back to stuff, you should study food science. You should send them to classes and stuff. We did the most fun labs, but we did this fun lab where we made candy. Uh, and one of the things we did was we, uh, extruded little things of like uh, mango puree that had alginate in it uh, into a calcium solution. And it formed like little balls, little uh, cohesive um, spheres because it bonds with itself to create a structure. Um, it's, I, uh, I wish that I had taken a, gotten a picture for this so that I could explain it a little bit further, but there's lots of uh, uh, applications of this with um with actually creating structures for um for like not gelatin but um one of my professors he did a whole study on this dr julian mcclements highly suggest he's uh checking out any of his papers he's the most published food science professor in the world um and Ooh, that's yeah. really interesting you're like making me want to go and do these labs now and just make Super weird fun. stuff out of food <laughs> i know um, right <laughs> Another one of our questions is, what are the extra food safety challenges specifically in space? Well, so they're um, considering the fact that there's not the same atmosphere that we have here. It's not like it's the same um, kind of uh, worries I want to say for like botulism, but in like no atmosphere, if you're like releasing the food out into like the like into no atmosphere, you know, it would go through stuff, it wouldn't have the same like problems. But because you're doing it in an oxygen rich environment, and it has to be a specific temperature, you're actually keeping your food at a pretty, uh, like if, if you're not refrigerating it properly, if like the astronauts, which I'm sure they know a little bit about food safety, or I hope they do, um, would like uh, store things in the correct conditions, they might not, it, there might be problems with uh, like, uh, things going bad because if you're not actually storing it correctly if you're putting it in the, the optimal temperature that a human wants to be in that's the optimal temperature that like a microbe wants to be in it's a really good point so everything yeah, every system they develop for a spacecraft that's trying to keep the humans alive is also making the food go bad yeah. so it's a very difficult without creating a whole new system and environment you know to keep the food good yeah um, and using resources to do that it's quite a tricky problem um are there any interesting overlaps between molecular gastronomy style cuisine and specifically AM technologies? So this is actually something that I've been thinking about more recently where uh, my goal in the end is, I, I mean, like, I'm going to go to grad school soon. I'm going to, I'm hopefully going to make my own 3D food printer that I can release to the public. Um, I think that a lot of people who, if, if, if any like person wants to print for themselves, they would probably be sticking to things like a burger or something that they want to eat. But if you have like, uh, some kind of high, like fancy, high cuisine, like restaurant, you could print things that you, flavor combinations that you've never been able to explore because of the limitations of, um, of how you have to cook things. So mm -hmm. like if you, there are some companies right now that, um, ooh, uh, Foodberry, I think is what it's called. There's a place in Boston that is like making uh, little berries of different flavors and stuff, which it was really interesting to taste. I actually got a chance to, to taste that, but it's not things that you would think about. So it's not something that you're necessarily used to. So if you're thinking about molecular gastronomy, like they're, pro they're experimenting with things that you like, uh, that most normal consumers are not going to want to, <laughs> to eat or yeah, not well, going to think about eating. Also on like a geometric scale, because I mean, from mainly from whiskey tasting, oxidation itself can make a big difference to taste and things oh, as yeah. well. So simply by having a super, super porous structure or something that's getting a lot of oxygen in there, you're going to change the flavor of things as well. So, um, yeah, definitely. And we're excited to hear, to see your um, food printer come onto the market. So when it does, let us all know, please. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, what developments are needed from current technology to improve space applications? I assume that, yeah. 
in the first yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah, I mean, like in general, space applications is definitely like in, in general, there's a lot of things that have to happen. I think specifically things that you uh, that you're going to want to uh, they're going to need to like be looked at are um, the, the speed of printing, uh, the safety of the actual printers itself, because um, I'm doing some looking into how to make food contact things. It's very different from food safe thing, like food safe, uh, like actually printing food. So um, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different things that you need to think about. Uh, I also think about like the pressure of which you, you need to be able to print. I want to I would love to do some experiments with printing in zero gravity so that I can understand it a little bit more, you know, to really see where we need to be able to do. We need to be able to improve the accuracy and the quality and like the food safety of everything. Again, there's also a ton more information on my paper. So if you're interested in that, I can send a link to my um, uh, to my email if you're interested, if anyone's interested, because I don't get any of the money from bu you buying the paper. <laughs> so, I, is this being recorded? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it is being recorded, but that's, it's fine. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't get any of that money, so I'm like, I'm like, I'm happy to send people my paper. I wrote this. I spent two years on this. Like, um, I guess, what was he going to say? Something <laughs> along the lines. That's all right. I can't remember. I'll just have to come back to it. Um, there's another question that's come to the top now, which is what does the food actually taste like when it's come out of a 3D printer and will it ever taste as good as normal food? Well, I mean, like, hopefully it will. <laughs> I really hope that it will. That's all, hopefully the whole point. You're not just trying to replace it. It's not just like a replacement for cooking. It's ho hopefully a supplement for people who have like who need it. Um, but there is also like there's a long way to go. I'm honestly thinking that the texture, like when I'm going to be studying it, uh, I'm thinking that the texture is probably the first thing that's going to have to be studied and then the flavor. And then you're going to have mm -hmm. to think, or well, I guess the look obviously first, but that's 3D printing. But then, and then the scent is actually probably going to be the last thing that's going to be yep. like there, because that's actually, I don't know if anyone here has like looked into olfactory stuff. It's actually the most complicated. Like <laughs> That's really, really quite interesting because I agree in that some foods I'm, I'm very much a texture person as well. Some foods yeah. I will just not eat because of the texture. Um, taste probably then comes after that. But I think, yeah, taste and the scent are quite closely linked. Um, they are, but there's a lot of complicated um, like molecules and ways that your brain recognizes scents, which I was recently talking with a professor who studied olfactory uh, like reactions. And she was like, yeah, we've only barely scratched the surface of some of these different uh, like scents for things. Like there's a reason why uh, pure vanilla like extract is different than like a artificial vanilla because there are undertones and stuff that you just don't get. In addition to like flavors, there's a scent that you're just not getting because there's, it's a very, vanilla is very complex. So is every scent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And then, I mean, it's, it's very similar in a way to trying to re recreate, you know, organs and bioprinting that yeah. sort of thing, right? They have such a very, very, very small structure that you really have to replicate if you are going to replicate the real thing and trying yeah. to get it tasting like real food. It's always going to be slightly different until it's exactly the same. And that's, you know, that's going to be all, a long way off, likely. Yeah. Um, another question. How long has Mark Forge been investigating printing food and then how much support is going into this field? So Mark Forge itself is not actually investigating uh, <laughs> printing food. This is a this is a me thing. I studied this uh, in college, and then I went to Mark Forge because I because uh, I actually I had worked with Mark Forge printer before, and I really like the stuff that we print. I think our metal printers are like the coolest thing ever. But like, um, there's not a ton going into the actual like printing food. Um, mm -hmm. but like, maybe there'll be something in the future about food contact surfaces. Maybe there'll be some stuff about. Um, investigating in the future but it's not like i i'm currently not working on that yep um our next speaker is apparently still not here yet so we're gonna just keep asking some questions for you if that's okay rachel i Everyone's love attention so. Before, so um we're just gonna keep firing them at you um do you want to give us a quick rundown of Mark Forge's printer, like printer set. You said the metal printers are your favorite, but you also developed. Did you develop one of their machines? I assume ex assume ex extrusion machines for food. So how did that come about? Where did you start? Well, so I mean, like I. 
When I was in college, I was working with a bio printer that we were uh, retrofitting to print food. Uh, because of the pandemic, I actually never ended up being able to um, to work on like printing out real food. I was just working on actually getting it up and running and printing out different things like Floronic F127, which sounds super random that I say, but it's like a super cool material. Uh, it's liquid at cold temperatures and solid at room temperatures. Um, so it's something that was easy to print so you could, so you could test it. Um, but like, so I've worked with our extrusion machines. I really like the metal printers. Oh, I wish I brought it up here. I printed out the coolest thing, uh, a mask, which I should post a picture of on LinkedIn. So anyone add me on LinkedIn, uh, and you can keep up with, uh, whatever I post it on the, the type for women in 3D printing group as well. Yeah. Be very excited to see it. Because, uh, so I printed out in metal, like it's a, um, it's a cathedral mask, so it's it looks like a gothic cathedral. Um, but I printed parts of it in metal and parts of it in onyx, which is our uh, nylon carbon fiber material. Um, That's what I've been printing in recently. And yeah, so I can absolutely help try and help recently. you. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to stay online afterwards for a little bit of technical support for my lab, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, hit me up. <laughs> I will, our other speaker has actually just signed on though, so I okay, will have yeah. to wrap it up there. Um, there are so many more questions actually in the Q&A for you, so maybe if people want to reach out to Rachel afterwards in the networking session in half an hour, definitely do so. And yeah, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer all your questions. So thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. This has been great. I'm so glad that you all were invested. There's yeah. definitely a lot of interest in this in this area, so keep doing your good work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel.